Well, I was trying to decide um, what I should start with. And amazingly, three of the, the top three places that he mentioned uh, as uh, part of Verona was Maple Drive Dairy Way, where I worked, the turkey farm where I picked turkeys, and, and the poor farm. But I didn't work at the poor farm, I worked at the county farm across the road. So I was connected with three of them right off the bat. But what I'm going to do is start with my parents' marriage because I was born shortly after and so I will go from the time I was born until I left. My folks were married in um, 1927, and they were living in Madison. And my uh, father worked at Cops Cafe, which was a very popular restaurant, well, cafe just off of the square. And um, when um, I was born, he um, was selling. Uh, newspaper subscriptions as a contest and he won a doll for me and I have a picture of it it was in the paper and the doll was as big as me and um, I they lived in Madison when I was born and when my brother Maynard was born and then they moved out to the farm. And Lori was born in 31, and she was born in the house. And Dad's sister, Lorna, was still living in the house. So she was there when Lori was born. And a niece of my mother's were there to take care of Maynard and I and help with the new baby. And then uh, I think Aunt Lorna, I, I'm not sure how long she lived there, but um, Chris and, and Sophie were also living there and until um, Sophie died in 1935. And we always had relatives there to help with the kids. The twins were born in 36, so it, it we were a pretty big family. And um, so we always, even during the summer when um, I was in school, we had high school girls come out and help with all the work and the cooking, the farming and everything. And married couples were there. And um, as I grew up, I usually worked in the house. Um, helping with the cooking and washing, ironing, that sort of thing. And Marlene was always outside with mother. They were working in the garden or whatever. Then in 1935, the electricity came through. So that's when we decided, we also have a picture of the, a big write-up in the paper showing all the people that in their uh, new appliances. My mother is, is in, has already lived there and they're uh, using a waffle iron and my dad is using an electric razor. <laughs> and then um, that's evidently when dad decided to do the, bait, the dairy. He had had, they had cows but were milking by hand but when he started the dairy we got uh, milk, uh, milk uh, electric work milking machines, and we made the garage that it was attached to the house, the dairy. And that's where we um, had a big cooler. We cooled the milk, bottled it, delivered it, and then came back and washed the bottles and filled them up again for the next day. Now, we did the bottle of the milk by hand. We had a big 
stand that had a big uh, container up on top that they poured a, a can of milk in, and then we put the bottles underneath that and had a handle that raised the bottles up and they filled with milk, and then we brought them over here and put caps on them. Put them in a me metal crates and into the cooler. And we did that, filled up the cooler enough to fill up the truck for the next day. We have, uh, yeah, well, the reason it was called Maple Drive Dairy was because we had a whole line of maples across the front on which would now be Nine Mound Road. I, I think there might be two or so of those houses left, or I mean trees. Um, I don't remember um, what our hours were for the dairy, but I have to hear someone gave us a questionnaire at one time. And the dairy was in operation from 1937 to 1943 when it was sold to Bowman's. We delivered milk in Verona, Middleton, and Madison. And I remember a couple of the houses in Madison that we delivered to, a few places in Middleton, and I don't remember Verona at all, but I'm sure that we had a lot of places. The one thing I remember about delivering the milk was when I went with my dad, we got to stop at an ice cream shop in Middleton for a break. And what if, if I had to go with a hired man, he always spent too much time at a little bar just outside of Middleton. <laughs> and I had to sit in the cut truck and wait for him. <laughs> we delivered the milk daily, and I still haven't figured out how the heck we had time to deliver milk if we were going to school. I have no idea how much we delivered, or um, what the uh, price of it was. I do remember that um, sometimes when we pick up the empty bottles, there would be change in the bottles for, I don't know if it was for the milk that day or for the next day. And we um, delivered raw milk for a while till the uh, we were required to get a pasteurizer, so then we started pasteurizing milk. Um, we have some uh, bottles and pictures and things over here of things that we had for the dairy. And there's also a, a plaque back there that says Maple Drive Dairy. And um, Oh, yes, we, we made these, I probably helped paint those too. Dad made them, they're insulated boxes that we could put the milk in so it wouldn't get too warm or too cold. People would have them on their porch. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course we always had a few little gifts. There's a towel holder there. And, um, the handle on the boxes is a milk bottle with a maple drive dairy on it. A towel holder. <laughs> and a hot pad. We had um, the smaller bottles, we had pint bottles and creamers. <laughs> Now, um, we eventually, um, 
I, I still haven't figured out when we, when Dad put in the third floor for us four girls. It was an attic that he finished off. It had a big walk-in closet and built-in cupboards and drawers, so each one of us had our own space. And there, we had two double beds up there, and Maureen and I slept together, and the twins slept together. The one big problem was that the twins were in our stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, so that's still, uh, the, when people were touring the house, they were really surprised to see how nicely finished that room was. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, after the dairy was sold, um, oh my goodness, I forgot one important thing. When I started school, my mother decided that we, Verona should have a preschool. So my class was the first preschool in the old uh, graded school, and she had the classes in the in the group gym. And there were, I believe, ten of us that went to school together for thirteen years. Anyway, after we sold the farm, or the dairy, my dad was still farming, and so he decided to demonstrate balers for Carl Stotts, who is still in business in Wanake. And the first baler had to be tied automatic or by hand. So we, uh, my brother and I, one on one side and one on the other, one st stuck the, st the uh, wire through to the other side, and then the other one had to twist the tie, the wire to, to tie the bales together. And we did that for a couple of years, and of course that was just during the summer. And then they went to an automatic baler which was tied with twine. And I wrote on the back of that to make sure that they were tied. Once in a while they'd come through with the one that wasn't tied, so I'd have to tie it. And, and we did that uh, um, pretty much through um, high school. In the meantime, I was bailing hay in the summer, and between my freshman and so, no, yeah, I was still bailing between my freshman and sophomore year. Between my sophomore and junior <coughs> year, I worked at Barron's in the stocking department when they were rationed. And of course, when we had sales, it was crazy. We had to also uh, had a filing cabinet in the in the basement. So if anybody wrote in that they wanted silk stockings, we had to check and make sure they could get them. Um, they were allowed so many a year, I guess. And then in my June, between my junior and senior year, I was riding the automatic baler in the summer. And I was working at the auditorium after school in my senior year. And then when I got married in 1949, we had our rehearsal dinner at the auditorium. And then after I graduated, I worked at the county farm. And I was working there when I got married. 
I had to live out there then. But I remember one Christmas Eve, it was the people that were running the place was having a Christmas dinner or a Christmas party. And um, my dad called him and said, can Merlin come home for Christmas? And they said, well, yeah, she'll be done serving about 9 o'clock. So then he came out and got me so I could be home for Christmas Eve. Um, I was married when they had the fire. Actually, Laureen and Freddie uh, were at our house in Middleton, and one of the twins called and said that the apartments were on fire. Now, Dad had started that uh, Quonset as a place to put in the machinery when he was working for Carl Stotts. But because of the war, he couldn't get all the supplies to finish it. And then he heard about all these vets families that were looking for places to live. Then some of them wanted to go to the university. And so he talked to all the neighbors and asked if he could get whatever supplies they had to finish it for an apartment house. And so that was, um, I think they had 24 families in there when they had the fire. And um, after the fire, he uh, remodeled the house again for more apartments. And the, the house was full of couples, mostly veterans, that um, needed a place to live. So, I, uh, at that time I was gone, I don't really know what all went on there, but Laureen and her husband were managing the apartments at that time. And then I think, well, it's unbelievable how many of the family lived in that house. I think probably most of Laureen's family when they first got married, most of the kids lived there until they got a house of their own. And um, um, I guess the one thing that I I'm going to finish talking about Bob before Laureen takes over. Um, we had our family, um, Laureen, Maynard, and Verna all lost children. And we also had three of us in the family, myself, Vera, and my oldest daughter are all breast cancer survivors. Um, my brother was in service, uh, went into service, and then Lauren had to kind of take over his jobs at the farm. And um, let's see. We, um, part of the cross country park now is um, was our part of our farm. It had a pond, which it still has, and um, hickory nuts and trees and lots of wildflowers. And um, there's there's kids down there who's working or uh, playing it there right now. That was part of our farm. Um, it was sold off, and, and Marty will be telling about how the property was sold off here and there. Um, anyway, with with everything that went on, the family is is a very close knit family, and um, any hardships that there were, the whole family was always there to help. Um, I'm really very proud of every one of them that 
has been a part of this, and no matter what happens, we're all together. And um, I have quite a few of my family here, and Marlene's family, Kenny's family. They're, they've all been great supporters for me, and um, I'm very pleased to have this chance to talk about my life and, and our call farm. Um, every year, Verona had what they called farm days. They always had a parade, and they put on a play, and um, I happen to have a copy here of a play that they put on in 1946 called Henry's Mail Order Wife. <coughs> okay, and uh, um, the cast was Aaron Hemsel, he was a bachelor, Elmer Dragger, Marvin Thompson, Doris Roethlisberger, Phil Roethlisberger, and me. Oh, I know. <laughs> so I had, anybody wants to look at the farm, or at this little program, I'll have this up here too. I just want to add that um, when Dad, <laughs> when Dad uh, went and divided our house all up, and the main house is still there, and we had people in those people that were living in there. They all lived in one bedroom. Oh. It was just amazing how those people live. But they didn't care at that time because there was no place to go and live in Madison. So they were just glad to have a roof over their head because they would come home, they'd go to school all day and then they'd come home and maybe fix something to eat and, and then they had a place to sleep. So they had a roof over their head. So the people were very grateful for just living in one room. And some of them lived there for quite a while because I had a couple of families that had, one had two little kids. And so when uh, her husband was going to school, she decided to get a job, and she did, so then I babysat. <laughs> and, uh, but most of these people lived there for, you know, not a long time, a year or two, but they were just so grateful to have a roof over their head, and um, and they would be there every day. But that was it, you know. But um, anyway, um, when when she was talking about delivering milk in Verona, we did deliver a lot in Verona too. And that box there, in particular, was a classmate of mine that lived in Verona, and one day gave that to me because he said, here, you know, your, my dad was one of your, your dad's customers, and this is what we used to put the milk in on the porch. <laughs> so that worked out pretty good anyway. Um, and I, I like to say too that my, my mother never had to do too much as far as the dairy was concerned and all these other things that we did on the farm. But she was the one that was always busy in the house fixing meals and always had a lot of people there. Um, because when we had uh, the dairy, we had, we have a picture of here of some of them that were the uh, guys that all helped deliver the milk. And there's, yeah, there's quite a few of them. And, um, they all lived in the house too. Yeah, when, when we had, we had, yeah, we had uh, two or three of them that would live in the house when they, they were just single guys and they would help deliver milk. But they would. Uh, but, but my mother always fixed. We had a big table, so she always fixed enough for the whole table. We never had much problems. 
No, no. But you know, in those days, you used to have big meals all the time. But but that's my mother was always fixing meals and and even I think probably washing clothes for a lot of them. So um, yeah, we we had quite a. Um, Was that that garage you mean? Yeah, across the way. Yeah, I put up on the No, there. no, Dad put that up, that garage, built that garage there someplace. Maybe Marty knows when he did that. No. Okay. Yeah. So that was there for quite a while. Oh. So that that was there for quite a while in that and um, um we had a married couple that lived in there then I don't remember Marty but what, what did he work with dad on the dairy or what yeah. Well, yeah so he had a garage and they had an apartment up above and so he had a place for the people to live too and then uh, I don't know dad was always worrying about people making sure they had a place to live I guess mm -hmm. yeah so, um, do you want to talk to Marty about how? Hello, I'm Martin Palmer. I'm the fourth generation of Chris Call who started this farm. I'm here to give you a little bit of information on the creation of the parcel, the original 160. Um, so my mother, or my parents are Laureline and Fred W. Pulver. My grandfather was Vernon, and my great-grandfather was Chris Call. Chris was originally born in the Blue Mounds area, and the land that he purchased and that this farm sat on consisted of 160 acres in the Verona Township. The eastern 80 acres was in section 15, and the other 80 acres was in section 16. This is a location that's north of Edwards Street and east of Nine Mound Road. It was a half mile square. I wish I had known that Jesse had all this PowerPoint. I got a couple, I got a larger one, but it's a 18, 73 plat map. If you like to pass it around, I'll show you the acres of it. Before Chris bought this land, it was owned by three different people. And I'll give you a little bit of description of that in a minute. But when you take from this area here, if you were to start at Nine Mound Road, and Edward Street and proceed straight north, travel past the original farmhouse, keep continuing north past the town garage, and go up to what is now Spruce Street and Basswood. And at that point, if you turn to the right, traveled east towards County Highway M, you would be just stopping short of that circle that's to the back side of the administration building of the school. From there, if you would turn south and travel back down, you're almost going to end up at Edward Circle, which would bisect through Harriet Park. From there, at Edward Circle, you would turn to the west and travel back over to Nine Mountain Road. So, a lot of the Verona homes that are back in that area are on this Chris Cole property. To create the 160 acres, I'm going to back up to the 1800s. In the 1861 Platt book, the land was listed as being owned by three separate owners. You're going to recognize some of these names. In 1861, a gentleman by the name of B. Wilson owned the northwest 40 acres of section of that northwest section. 
On that section drawing, it shows the original farmhouse, which I don't know if that one's in here. Right there. That's the original acres that was on the first 40 that this B. Wilson owned. In the northeast section, 40 acres, which would be section 15, a gentleman by the name of Ed Donkel owned 40 acres. In the southwest and southeast 80 quadrant below that, a gentleman by the name of John Flory owned that. So he owned from Edward Street north to that center section where these other two 40s were. In 1873, a gentleman by the name of J. France owned the northwest and northeast sections of 15 and 16. Still had the original farmhouse on it, this building here. In 1890 Platte Book, J.S. Myers owns 160 acres with the original farmhouse It, and the second house that was on this property is now gone. I forgot to mention that. John Flory in his bottom section of the 80, if you look on that plant map that I passed around there, it shows a house that's in the southwest corner of Edward Street and Nine Mile Road. Uh, if I could, my cousin Cherry, her parents actually owned a house on that property in almost that same location. And that house is still there today. Not the original house, but the house that her parents built. One bedroom. She yeah. One bathroom. Three bedroom, one bathroom. <laughs> so in 1890, J.S. Myers owns the entire 160 with the original farmhouse and the second farmhouse gone. In 1899, a J.S. Myers owns the Northwest and Northeast 80 section with the original house. And a gentleman by the name of Carl's, doesn't give any initials, but it says Carl's owns the Southwest and Southeast sections of 80 acres with no structures. In 1904, Carl's owns the 160 with the original house still on it. And then in 1908, the land sale was to Chris Call for the 160 acres with the original house still on it. Now I'd have to bet by this time that house probably wasn't in very good shape anymore. It looks still pretty good right there, but it probably wasn't big enough for Chris for what he had his future planned out for, I guess. At that time, I was told by my father that Chris, around that time, had the barn built first before he ended up building the house. And supposedly it was a company that came out of the Chicago area and they stayed right there for a period of four months to construct the barn. That's the barn in the background there. That barn was not typical for barns that were built around that time and in that area. Most of the dairy barns housed between 20 and 30 animals at the most. This barn here was a suspension or what they call the hung barn. There wasn't one post in this basement. That barn could, I, I never knew a number, but I would have to say it probably housed 50 animals at that time. The upstairs was a bent frame type construction, but it had metal rods hanging from the upper beams in that barn that carried the floor beams, which carried the floor. Supposedly there's a barn like this in the Fort Atkinson area. I'm still trying to find it so I could get some pictures of it. One of the f ironic things about this barn is that the day it went down, it was still just as straight as the day it was built. Uh, my uncle Kenny and I kind of had a chuckle, chuckle about it when the guy tried to tear it down. At that time it was sold off to uh, Barth Brothers at a later date. But when they um, went to develop the land out there and they were putting in the cross-country heights additions, 
There was a gentleman from the Verona area here that was going to tear that barn down. His name was Kermit Peterson. When he did that, it was typical for him to dig a standard bent frame barn, cut the siding boards off, and pull it over on its end. Because of this type of construction, when he went to do that, the barn wouldn't go down. So Kermit got the idea that he'd tie a cable to it and he was going to try to twist it. And when he did, the barn collapsed upon itself and basically destroyed every timber that was in it. The cable that he had through it, he had borrowed somebody's record. I think it was John Rowley's. The cable was stuck in the timbers and they had to cut the cable to get it loose. A couple nights later, I came home and I could see Kenny over there picking through it. And he was collecting artifacts, what he could find, but that were salvageable. <laughs> So anyways, getting on to my grandfather, or my great-grandfather. In 1911, Chris owns, shows up on a plat map, is owning the original 160, with the original house still being shown on the plan. In 1922, the new house was built in 1914. Chris owns the 160, but there were no structures shown on that plat map. In 1931, Chris owned the 160. Now it shows the new house, but we know the house was built in 1914. At that time, Chris surrendered the farm or gave it to Vernon or whoever to start his dairy operation. And in 1947, Platt book, Vernon was now the owner of 160 acres. In 1953, Platt book, Chris now owns the farm again. This is after the dairy was sold out. Chris now owns the farm. It doesn't say when the land transfer was. I'm assuming it was right shortly after the fire of the apartment building because the fire of the apartment building was March of 1953. Chris owns 60 acres in the um, northwest and 20 acres of the uh, southwest in section 16. Vernon owned 40 in the northeast quarter, which would have been originally from a section that was drawn out in 1861. Also at that time in 1953, Mr. E.B. Sokolowski owned 20 acres in the southwest section and 40 acres in the southeast section. If anybody remembers Mr. Sokolowski, he had the Verona Rock Shop for years. He developed those areas at that time, somewhere in the 50s. And in 1955, Sokolowski owned 50.6. So I'm assuming at that time, with the development of Edward Street, Harriet Street, Harriet Park, 10 acres or 9.4 was donated to the city for Harriet Park. With that, he created the other streets, Mark, Todd, Barbara, Mary Lou. Those were all grandkids or children of his own. In that 1955 plat book, somewhere along the line, a parcel was created for my grandmother to finish raising her family, which at that time still would have been Kenny, it shows that Chris owned 59.6 and 49.8 in two separate sections with the parcel being created for the house, which is still standing there today, the original called Farmhouse. If you could take this section of property and place it over Google Maps over the city of Rona right now, if you look on those descriptions of those lot lines that I told you about, you can actually see the tree lines, the original tree lines in the fence lines coming down through, excluding the portion of where you end up being west of West Lawn Avenue down to Edwards Circle, that tree line isn't there. But if you look at the other ones, you'll still see those original tree lines. You can still see the one pond in the back, and you can still see the one pond that's over 
off the Verona School Forest. I don't know if that's still there, that nature preserve. Part of that pond is still sitting back in there. Those ponds were great places to collect tadpoles. They grew excellent cattails. And they had this tremendous blue modeling clay in the bottom of them. They were a lot of fun. Yeah. It was um, kind of humorous to watch the development process of the uh, Aspen Avenue area, Cross Country Heights. I remember growing up as a kid and in the spring thaws, the amount of water that ran down to those areas and drained out into those fields. Those three big ponds that were back there, even though they were divided by chunks of land, I remember two of the larger portion ones that we used to ice skate on and sled down the hillside. The water would get deep enough where those two ponds would connect. And when I heard of some of the water problems that people had in their new homes, the developer should have done a little bit of investigating or asked people that grew up there what happened around in that area. One of the other uh, funny things that we got to observe is when they put in Aspen Avenue, on the lot next to us, some of the buildings that they tore down, Jerry Caban was the excavator for Horizon Investment and Development. And right next to part of the parcel that I ended up buying in 1985 from my grandmother, they had tore down a couple of the structures and they dug a big hole and buried it in there. And part of doing that is the guy ran through an old drain field from the dairy operation and was wondering what that was from. And I said, well, there used to be a big dairy here at one time. Anyways, they dug a big hole and they pushed all this debris into it. And I don't think it was a year later that the realtor stuck a for sale sign in it. And somebody bought that parcel. And the first day of digging, the guy started hitting all the debris about halfway back. And I remember for two days they dug and then for like another two days they hauled in Phil. There was a lot of history on that farm. I grew up, there was a million places to hide on that. I wish I'd uh, had a few more of the farm. This building here was just a small workshop halfway between the house to the, and to the barn. And it was more of a, um, Stall parking, I think it was probably more than maybe for one of the milk trucks. Later on, at a later time, they ended up building another building. I don't, I don't think they have it on. time they built this other building in here and this is the one my mother was talking about if you can look at this picture and this picture is actually an aerial photography <coughs> book that's uh, from 1958 there's a gentleman that did a book called farms of Dane County Kenny borrowed it from the Thompson family but that's where they took this aerial photography from somebody put the cloud in their Maple Drive dairy. But it talks about the farms of Dane County, shows all the farms around the Rhone area, but this one here. So this one is from like 1958. I'm sure Chris and Vernon never erected the concrete silo, because it never is an end of the other picture. So I don't know when that concrete silo was. Anyways, this hired hand house that they built during the dairy operation, was rather unique because it had totally 
timber frame floor for the ground floors. Below that floor was a stairway to get down there, but to get into that stairway, it was a drive over access that you flipped the big trap door open and they could actually stand in there and work on vehicles. Oh, that's it also why that served, was there. It also oh, served as a stairway, but that entire basement floor down there was all dirt floor. It was divided by a room, so there was another room. And I'm sure they used it for fruit root cellar storage at that time. There was a, so that was one of the places to hide get lost. <laughs> <laughs> this knob that's originally back here, there was a windmill set there. That's where the original farmhouse sat for this property. Then when they built the new one, all you can see is just a little bit of the roof line right there of the new farmhouse. This was the corn crib. There's an old little hay, uh, horse barn. You can see the top of it standing over. This was a chicken coop. So not only did they deliver milk and cream, it was also butter and eggs. Chickens. The other building, then. so it would have to be after 53 that this picture was taken because what you can't see is the shed, which a machine shed, which was converted into an apartment after the war to create student housing, which burnt in 53. So somewhere between 1953 and 58 is when I drew this picture. And I have to add, because it's amazing when you think how when we first started there, the dairy and how we did everything, and today, you know, it would be absolutely freakish <laughs> because, I mean, until we got the pasteurizer in there, it was, you were just taking a chance that you were doing everything good. And we never heard of anybody ever getting sick or anything happening, but... We didn't have all the restrictions that they had against yeah. and, uh, and the funny part was that when my kids were, my oldest one was just old enough so that when he found out that we were pasteurizing, one day I caught him going down the road with his wagon and I said, where are you going? Well, um, Mr. Thompson said I could have some of his milk because I don't like that pasteurized milk. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it. But, uh, you know, he, he just thought it didn't taste the same and he, he wanted raw milk. <laughs> we have a lot more pictures of the farmhouse. This is one that was at a later time it would have to be I'm going to say late 40s, early 50s in there somewhere. At this time, I'm sure they probably did it after the time of the apartment fire and that Chris and Vernon needed to house more room for people from the, that were displaced by the fire. Because in the original photos, and a couple of them later, when my mom and the kids were little, this south room was not on here. This was added at a later time. The front of this originally, had an entire covered front porch all screened in. <coughs> so that porch has been taken off. Around the back side of the house, this small room that you can see right here was originally just a walkout porch. It was a shaker porch. So this was just an area that was for a shaker porch. Afterwards, when I suppose they needed more room, they converted that into another kitchen, and a small sitting area. So originally around the back side of the house, if you look at a picture, you can see the door that came in from that shaker porch. There was no stairway up over the garage. That stairway is still on that house, and I think the new owners are here. But off that porch or through that kitchen, if they're in their bathroom, can you take that over to me, please? If you walk into that bathroom, I'm sure with the remodel that went on there, maybe they opened that wall back up and took that original door out. But that door was pretty neat when we were kids because it was a door in nowhere. <laughs> when you went in the bathroom and if you looked around the corner, there was a door. You couldn't open it 
but the door was still there. Uh, what was the other room? At that time when they had the dairy operation, the garage that was attached to the back side of that house is where they had the big coolers, and I'm sure that's where Mom and Kenny could probably tell us that's where they kept the butter and eggs once they harvested them. Halfway to the barn was another small building that was used for the dairy operation. Later, as we were kids growing up there, Kenny converted that, got rid of the old coolers that were in there, and converted it in so he could park his car in there. Uh, there was also an access hole through the stone wall in that garage that you could scurry into the basement into a back corner room. So there was a million places that nobody could find you. So I guess that's why I always had to go with you on Sundays to see Chris at the Four Winds home so you could feed him and keep an eye on me at the same time. <laughs> I got to live there for a while. Uh, and shortly after I was married, I had my first child. My sister started a family there. We all got to rent from our uncle upstairs in the farmhouse. It was still a two flat. Kenny and Kay lived downstairs with their family. But Kenny always found it in his heart to put up some family members and rent the upstairs of them. <laughs> Kenny could never get rid of us. <laughs> Thank you. I just have to add that when my grandpa built that house, for a long time, we were the only kids in the neighborhood that had that bathroom. Oh. There was a lot of them that still had their outdoor, and so we always thought we were very fortunate because we had such nice bathroom. <laughs> yeah, actually, would you mind coming up? Uh, if you guys would mind narrating some of the pictures that you have. Okay, uh, this is a picture. This is a picture of my dad's class when he was in high school. I don't know any of the rest of them. Oh wait, uh, this is Ruth Gordon. Her husband was a principal of the graded school. Jerry Maurer, yes. Now this is a, a picture of everybody in high school at the time. Um, um, well, even my mother is in here. I, oh, we had him. This is my mother's sister. Um, oh, and my mother, and then where's dad? <laughs> oh, here. But that was probably the whole high school. And he was a basketball player. And that's uh, my dad and his sister, Viola. Um, my oldest daughter is here today. This was a favorite, not only for us, but my kids remember this. We had a water fountain, and it was such good water. And this is my brother Maynard and Marlene, and evidently one of the twins. It's uh, right on the corner of, of the driveway up there. And this is a line of our elm trees, maple trees, I'm sorry. And these were the farm dairy men. This is Maynard. 
and this is my dad. And that was, um, I think, a strikes. No. <laughs> yeah, they had their suits that says Maple Drive Dairy. Okay, that's the original farm, uh, house with the screened in front porch and the barn. Yes, that tree is still there. Yes. Oh, and this is a, a band, and that evidently has to be the whole high school band because this is Verna, one of the twins. Um, and this is Lardy, and she, uh, she was a baton. This is Shet, Shet, Jets, Lila Kunzman, Jack, Jack the Horn, uh, yeah, and Bev Thompson, um, and this is uh, Berta, one of the twins. Uh, here? So that has to be the whole uh, high school band because uh, Lauren was way too, well, Verna was way behind me, so. You still play? No. <laughs> my, da my daughter does. Um, what, is, what is this? Class, 1948. Oh. Oh, the glee club that Lorraine was in? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've never seen that. Oh, and this was the football team. Yeah. I can uh, name quite a few people in there, too. Yeah. And there's the baton twirlers. Learning right in the middle. Oh, this was a um, picture of a couple that was living in the apartments. And um, Dad had this, um, got this, oh, it was uh, like a small bus that he ran people back and forth because a lot of them didn't have cars. That says Maple Drive Apartments. Uh, that's Dad on one of his tractors. Um, I, I think he might be hauling corn husk. I'm not sure. Yes. Yes. And these are pictures of the apartments after the fire. It was a huge concept that was had two stories and 24 families. Yes, they had a daycare and a, and a community kitchen. And they used the old dairy coolers. Oh, and this is one thing I forgot to explain. Um, after the fire, uh, we st still had, um, uh, well, it was after Mother got the property. Um, she got two acres settlement. And um, the only thing that was left on it besides the house was a little shop, which was um, 
at the end of the property. My brother had uh, um, built two duplexes on that property, and that's how I was able to come back to Verona. I told him if his uh, the other side of his duplex opened up, I wanted it. So I've been back here for two years. Anyway, uh, at the end of his property, there was a little shed down there. Um, they said it was kind of a blacksmith shop because Grandpa had a black, ran the blacksmith shop, which is now, and then it was Peter's Feed. And um, then he had this one um, on the farm, and that also, was also the chicken coop. And um, the little area that, uh, that they could work in, Lorraine's husband had a car, and he decided he wanted to race, race it. So he and my husband got together and got it all fixed up. My husband drove it, and um, at that time, the twins were 16 years old, so they called it Sweet 16. And he raced it until it got clobbered at one of the races, and that was the end of that. But that was our weekends. We loaded all, all the kids, even the babies, went to the races, and they come home covered in dust. And, and how many people knew about that racetrack? That was Legler's racetrack. Yeah. Yeah, it was just south of Verona. They had this racetrack. Is it still there? Yeah. We raced in Oregon and Edgerton and... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was just yeah. south of Verona. So those are those Lorraine's kids sitting on the car. This is... Oh, that was one of the big... That was Mom's 85th birthday. It was at our house in, in Middleton. And um, Marty got her, took her for a ride on his motorcycle. <laughs> it's probably twice that big now, the family. And this is a picture of one of the, you know, when the Verona has their home days. They used to have some of the seniors. It was a, a band. They played combs and and um, washed and um, my, my mother is here and and Dad's sister Lorna is also in there. question and answer, if you don't mind. Can we pass the mic around for some questions? You guys have questions? I also wanted to point out two, a uh, little side story. I got this awesome email two months ago that said, hey, I just moved to town, and I saw on your website, I'm living in the Maple Drive Dairy House. What What do you know about it? <laughs> and um, that person's here today, it's Kristen over there at the table. And I wanted to point her out because if there are people who love these old houses and love to live in them, they just go away. So thank you for, um, she, you said, I put you on the, on the spot, but you said you grew up in a historic home and you wanted to find another historic house. And um, yeah, so if you want to go uh, give Kristen a high five, the next kind of generation, you'll be up here in uh, 40, 50 years telling your story about this house as well. <laughs> um, so thank you, and thank you for letting me uh, point you out. Uh, who has questions uh, for either of the ladies, or who's got a question? And I think this one you have to kind of talk really close into. Um, I would like to ask what your mother's family name was, because apparently she was in the same class with your dad. Yeah, it was just, uh, Jesse, did, get the other mic. Oh, okay. She was originally from Illinois, and um, her family moved up here. They lived on a farm. Um, you go north as far as you can on Nine Mound Road, turn left. And then the first turn on the right, Hazel Neeland had a farm right there. And then the next farm my mother's family was living in. So she was in high school here for a couple of years. That's how she met. Her maiden name was Jones. Jones. 
No. No. Is Jonas not still family? Is he Jonas? No. No. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Didn't Mom say she was related to Blumkey's? Is that from Dad? What? Did Mom want to say she was related to the Blumkey family? That's Vernon's mom. No, that was Dad's side. Oh. <laughs> oh, that No. She's asking if she can have her family come up, and they're saying no. It, it takes a lot of guns to do this. Yes, Lauren and Kenny and I all have family here. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys want to do a big picture? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, let's let's see if there's any other questions. Any other questions? I'm going to do a big oh, oh, don't let him leave. Okay. Someone follow him in the bathroom. Make sure this guy's not sneaking out. Um, other questions for your first speakers today? Lawrence plays at 12. What cattle breed did they raise? What cattle breed did you have? Oh, my. I think they were Guernseys. Black and white. Black and white. Oh, Bernice has a question. What kind of cattle? Okay. How, many, how many did you milk? I don't know. <laughs> 45 and a half. When you went and delivered milk with your hired hand or, or your dad, did you run and carry the milk yourself? What, how did that work? We actually had a little carrier. You know, it, it might be just a couple quarts. And, um, and then I just, you, you know, took those. Yeah. You actually ran up to yes. the house and yes. put in the box and yes. collected the, the empties that came back. And, and I, and I actually mop bottled the milk, too. And what was the hired hand or your dad doing at that time? Getting well, the, he probably was running on the other side of the street. Oh, I see. He was delivering all yeah. the whole side. Yeah, right. Were this horses? Were the horses? No, with the truck. Mm -hmm. Yo, your question over here. Let me got a question over here. Those ten kids that you went to school with, or you were one of ten, are they still living? Uh, I really don't know. Um, I had, I had a list. Oh, I think um, Jean Margaret Larry um, is in a nursing home in Mount Horeb. 